Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des théères Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. We did win this election. So our goal now is to ensure the integrity for the good of this nation. This is a very big moment. This is a major fraud on our nation. We want the law to be used in a proper manner. So we'll be going to the U.S. Supreme Court. We want all voting to stop. We don't want them to find any ballots at four o'clock in the morning and add them to the list, okay? It's, it's a very sad, it's a very sad moment. To me, this is a very sad moment. And we will win this. And we, as far as I'm concerned, we already have won it. So I just want to thank you. And I want to thank all of our support. I want to thank all of the people that worked with us. And uh, Mr. Vice President, say a few words, please. Please. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to join you in, in thanking more than 60 million Americans who have already cast their vote for four more years for President Donald Trump in the White House. And while the votes continue to be counted, uh, we're going to remain vigilant, as the president said. Uh, the right to vote has been at the center of our democracy since the founding of this nation, and we're going to protect the integrity of the vote. But I really believe with all of my heart, with the extraordinary margins, Mr. President, that you've inspired in the states that you just described uh, and the way that you launched this movement across the country to make America great again, uh, I truly do believe, as you do, that we are on the road to victory and we will make America great again, again. Thank you, Mr. President. All right, President Trump, as we anticipated, falsely and prematurely declaring victory, saying that he won. Uh, he did not win. He has not won. The president falsely depicting the counting as vo of votes as a fraud and an embarrassment. That is not what is going on. What is going on is the normal democratic process. Almost everything President Trump said in his declaration of victory was not true. Uh, it is true. Uh, that he is ahead in the polls right now in Georgia and North Carolina. Whether or not Biden will ever catch up is a matter for Georgia and North Carolina and their election officials to decide. Uh, it is not true that he is winning Pennsylvania or winning Michigan or winning Wisconsin. They are still counting votes. They have literally millions, millions of vote-by-mail ballots that those three states are counting. It may well be that President Trump ends up winning this election. That might be once the ballots are counted. But what President Trump just said was undemocratic and false and premature. It is not accurate to say that he won. 
we do not know who won this election. And uh, I have to say, Dana, it's it's not a surprise. But still, years into this presidency, uh, I find it shockingly disappointing uh, that he still would continue to erode uh, faith that the American people have Mm -hmm. in institutions. What is going on right now is a clean and fair election, and there is no evidence to the contrary. I know we expected him to say something like that, but hearing the president of the United States in the middle of, uh, of an election, in the middle of an election where there are counting votes all over the country, to say what he said from the White House is just not something that I don't think any of us really expected to see and hear in our lifetime. That is not what democratically elected presidents or candidates for the presidency say. That's what authoritarians say. It's and, and when he said that, he, that, that people are going to be disenfranchised, the only person right now at this stage of the game who is trying to disenfranchise voters is Donald Trump because he is saying the voters who have, whose votes have not yet been counted in the states that he doesn't want them to be counted in don't count. Yeah, I mean, I think we should really underline what he's saying. He kept saying, I want the voting to stop. That's not what he's saying. He's really saying he doesn't want the votes that have already been cast to be counted. There is no justification for it. It's shocking, and it's really beyond the pale. I mean, he called it a fraud to count ballots in the United States of America. It's undemocratic. It's completely, and- it's completely ridiculous. But, I mean, notice that Vice President Mike Pence came up just a m- few minutes afterward and tried to paper over what the president had just said, which is that he does not want the votes that are still outstanding in states that he had not won to be counted. You can't paper over that when it comes from the mouth of the president of the United States from the White House. You know, Pence tried, Vice President Pence tried to say something that is a more traditional idea of we are grateful for the people who have voted for Mm -hmm. us. We want to be vigilant to make sure that that the ballots are all counted and we're confident that we're going to be victorious in the end. As if President Trump had not said what he just said, which was a premature and false declaration of victory. And once again, let me say, it may well be that President Trump ends up being reelected. And if he is, it will be because of the fair and count and uh, and assiduous and diligent counting of ballots in states like Arizona and Nevada, where he wants the counting to continue because Biden is ahead, and states where he does not want mm-hmm. the counting, not the voting. The voting's done, but the counting to continue where he is ahead because they have not count. They have not uh, brought in and counted all the millions, millions of vote by mail ballots, by the way, that were that were cast vote by mail because we're in the middle of a pandemic that the administration has not been able to get a control uh, over. Uh, Let me bring in Jim Acosta. And Jim, you know, we all were hoping that the president would not go there and lie and falsely and prematurely declare victory. Uh, Yeah. So, again, as always, it's not a surprise, but it is shocking. Absolutely. And, and Jake, I think our founding fathers are probably rolling in their graves right now. Uh, They did not envision a president of the United States delegitimizing an American election. And that is what the president just did a few moments ago. It's historic and it's historically awful. Um, I think one of the things that we're going to have to wait and see over the next several days is, and and they've been previewing this over at the White House and inside the Trump campaign, they're going to be uh, deploying, if they have not already deployed, an army of lawyers to all of these states uh, where they want to contest the results of, of the election uh, to try to cast aside votes that are still being counted. They want to question the legitimacy of these timelines uh, for counting ballots in states uh, where ballots are coming in after Election Day. The pres- it does not compute with the president that states are allowed to have uh, varying uh, ways of counting votes. Uh, that is that is one of the traditions of our, of our democracy, that states uh, sort of run their own affairs when it comes to counting votes. And the president does not get that. Uh, we did hear Vice President Mike Pence, as Abby was saying a few moments ago, uh, get up to the podium and contradict the president almost immediately and say that the uh, votes continue to be counted. So there was at least a, an ounce of decency in that room uh, when Vice President Pence came up there. He's obviously not going to 
tell the president to his face that he's wrong. But if you read between the lines, he was essentially he was essentially allowing for the fact that votes are going to continue to be counted, Jake. All right, Jim Acosta, thanks so much. Uh, let's bring in Republican election lawyer and CNN contributor Benjamin Ginsburg. Uh, he's on the phone with us. Uh, ben, uh, first of all, before we get to the morality of what the president did. I just want you, if you could walk us through, the president said he's going to go to the Supreme Court to try to uh, stop the the ballots from being counted. I, I'm not exactly sure what the strategy is. Is there a way for him to go to the Supreme Court and ask them to stop the counting of valid legal ballots from valid legal voters? No, there's really not, Jake. That, there's no natural path to that. There are procedures for, as the vice president said, continuing to count the votes. And you can certainly contest under each state's law the, the process of the way the election took place. And ultimately, you can try and get an appeal before the Supreme Court. There's no direct right of appeal for something like this to the Supreme Court. The president uh, is, is taking issue with the counting of ballots in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Uh, he is describing it as to stop voting, uh, as if people are still voting, but that's not what's going on. These are legal votes that have already taken place. They just need to be counted, right? Yes, there are legal votes that have taken place. Uh, the, the voters have made their expressions. They're in uh, the receipt of all the state officials, with the exception of Pennsylvania, which has its own law that extends the deadline. So these are all legally cast votes, and, uh, and, and the, the process of trying to toss them out for some reason would just, I think, be viewed by any court, including the Supreme Court, as just a massive disenfranchisement. It is Wednesday, the 4th of November of 2020, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Will no one rid us of these petty dictators? Wow. You know, I gotta tell you, it was uh, more than shockingly disappointing that Trump declared victory. At the same time, the cryons and the to vote totals, <laughs> it was great. Trump is giving this, like, victory speech. He should have given it from the balcony. What's up with that? Anyway, at the same time, they're showing uh, vote totals and electoral college totals, and Biden was winning both at the time that Trump's declaring victory, calling it a fraud. It's all a fraud. Well, yeah. How is it that that uh, Tillis and, and well, even, I would say, even Mitch... But Tillis, Ernst, Lindsay? <laughs> how, how did they win fair? They didn't win fairly. There was something going on there, and we all know it. Plus, how about counting the votes? You know, the ballots that were mailed in. They don't want to count those. Yeah, Trump is saying, well, we can't count votes after Election Day. At the same time, the GOP insisted, especially like in Pennsylvania, not to start counting the mail-in votes until after Election Day. Get that? Don't count the votes, votes after Election Day, but you can't start counting the mail-in votes that would be uh, dramatically more Democratic. Yeah, that's small um, and, uh, you, but you can't count those because they're being counted after, but the law says you have to count them after and then, and the GOP made that law. Uh huh. See how that works. That's how they did it in Russia. And I'm not kidding. And when I say they, I mean, Vladimir Putin. Okay. So this is all part of a Russian playbook. How is it? Then in the border areas along Texas and others that Trump won by a bigger margin than the totals that he got in 2016. How is that possible? I'll tell you how that's possible. There's some code in Cyrillic. I'm sure of it. Am I am I causing consternation? 
by bringing these up? Is Am I part of a disinformation campaign? I would hope that maybe we should just put those questions to bed. Let's check it out. You know, I kept saying, you know, these, these uh, voting machines can be hacked, and they have been, and they are. And I counter that with, but, you know, paper ballots, mail-in ballots cannot be hacked. Well, yeah, maybe not flipping totals necessarily, but if you just, I don't know, hide them in the Postal Service and ignore a court order to count them? Well, first you had to sweep them up and then hand them over to be counted. And DeJoy, being him, refused a court. How does that happen? Why were there not U.S. Marshals arresting his ass and throwing him in jail for contempt? We're talking about a judge here. Now, the judge did give some extra time. Offered it? I I, I hope that's not the case. You don't offer this order, this rule. Now, there has been some extra time granted, and that is because the counting still goes on. So the judge gave DeJoy a little bit more time to sweep these postal post offices. And I, I know it's only in a particular or a couple of particular states and only a couple of particular post offices. I would make the rule nationwide sweep every post office for and find any ballot that hasn't been handed over to that state and count it now. You got till Friday. Actually, you have longer, but we'll give you till Friday to start because you know what? They're going to ignore that too. Why are U.S. Marshals not sent there and turning to joy over to uh, a lockup? Because qualified immunity? Contempt is contempt. And if he refuses, forget it. Just send some U.S. Marshals in there and start sweeping those post offices for ballots that need to be turned over to be counted. What's so hard about this? Yeah, so I, I'm i having a hard time accepting vote totals from border states where Hispanics, Latin A, apparently voted for Trump in greater numbers than 2016. After Icebox Baby Gulag's four years letting brown kids die of the flu before the pandemic even started, and pneumonia and all these terrible things. Kidnapping kids from their parents to make a point, and then, oh, we got about, you know, the better part of 600 kids, we can't find their parents. Oh, well, I guess we'll have to adopt them out for a profit. And even the Cubans? You would think even the Cubans might look at that and go, I don't know, maybe we don't want that kind of thing. It sounds more like Fidel, but no, they voted for Batista. Yep. They wanted the old dictator back, the one that let the casinos run. Yeah, Cuba was on its way, and then Fidel came. And they don't want Fidel. So, yeah, the brainwashing worked. Socialist, give me a break. Cubans are afraid of socialism. The the Hispanics uh, vote block, whatever that is, along the border there is afraid of socialism. Uh, I would say there's a bit of brainwashing if that's the case. You mean GOP uh, talking points? There's nobody socialist in America, even Bernie, please. You know, it's a pejorative. <laughs> that's all it is. And somehow, somehow, I guess people go, oh, well, socialism, bad, blah, 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 blah. not even knowing. How can you call someone a socialist who invests in capital markets? How is that possible? I don't get it. Because when you invest in capital markets, that makes you a capitalist, not a socialist. Oh, they're calling a socialist because we want due process and equal protection for all. Once you start saying all, that's socialism. Every vote counts. That is our position. What's the GOP position? No, they're not, you socialist. 
Okay. Well, there's millions and millions of ballots to be counted yet. Count them. We already know they've thrown millions out, and I'm not even counting about the millions that were prevented from voting because of gerrymandering and all the other voter suppression activities that have gone on, right on down to closing drive through voting sites in Texas on, the, on election day, nine out of the ten. Could that have had some sort of impact in Texas? So what else is happening in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy on this smothered Benedict Wednesdays? Natural disasters are raging and Trump is making them worse. He makes everything worse. A federal labor authority stripped the collective bargaining powers of a national union representing more than 450 immigration judges. Judges! That's what Trump said. Judges. We have judges? Who, who ever heard of that? Yeah, he never heard of judges in a democracy. And the head of the Kentucky State Police resigned days after a report surfaced about old training materials that encouraged cadets to be physically ruthless while also quoting Hitler favorably. Well, good riddance. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where Chile's president loses a third interior minister in a year. In a whole year. <laughs> How? Who else does that? Well, we know. And Zimbabwe police arrested for the second time a journalist critical of the government. Wow, it's like a virus that's going around now, isn't it? All that and more. On West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Bon Appetit. Page at netrootsradio.com to the rightish of the page is our chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the leftish of the chat room link at the bottom or near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, you would help us resist as the founders originally intended. And how do we do that? Well, we pay our bills and we fly under the radar and then we continue resisting. And it's worked pretty good so far, almost 10 years. And we thank those of you who have been so generous over all these many years. And uh, i got to be honest with you, we could use a few more of you out there that if you could afford an espresso-type coffee drink, even in these times of peril, we can stretch those dollars really beyond compare. And we have a lot of experience at it. Well, because we've been doing it for almost 10 years. <laughs> yeah. And uh, thank you for considering doing so. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that, and we thank Tom for doing that as well. You can follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. Get that linked up on Twitter and those other social media platforms. Yeah, even Zuckerberg. But you know what? We need to break up Facebook. We do. Make that a priority. I know there's a few other things in line, but we should keep that in our little quiver as well. Why don't we? Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and really wherever fine podcasts can be found mixed in with all the rest of us. Because all the rest of us are there too. <laughs> so far, at least for now. All right, let's dive into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. 
and it comes out of The American Independent by Daniel Bugislaw. As political turmoil escalates on Election Day, ecological havoc is spread as well. Natural disasters are affecting millions from California all the way to the Gulf Coast as Trump has failed to address these ongoing calamities while continuing to push policies that aggravate their human cost. In California, where Trump had previously refused to provide wildfire disaster relief, fires continue to rage. This week alone, 90,000 people were put on evacuation standby in Orange County as the skies filled with smoke from the Silverado Fire. Despite reversing his stance on providing California disaster aid after pressure from senior politicians in the state, Trump has maintained that the fires are caused by a lack of logging and forest management rather than climate change and unchecked development into fire-prone areas because, I got to tell you, people sweep their uh, backyards and front yards pretty damn well. Why are they catching on fire? Now, just on Monday, this week, the Trump administration stripped EPA protections from the Tongass National Forest in Alaska, one of North America's largest carbon sinks. The move will allow logging companies to build logging roads and chop down trees in the temperate rainforest. That will likely lead to the forest capturing less carbon through the air and the soil, as well as poisoning the waterways that are essential for Alaska's native salmon population, let alone what it's going to do to the permafrost. What happens with the permafrost? Well, it starts letting methane get out. What happens when methane gets out? Yeah, it heats up the atmosphere. What happens when the atmosphere heats up? Some of us aren't going to be breathing. Some of us. And in a last-ditch bid for farmers' boats... Trump removed gray wolves from the endangered species list this week. The move would allow hunters and cattle ranchers to kill America's 6,000 gray wolves, which have only just now started to rebound from near extinction because who needs an umbrella anymore in a rainstorm? We're already dry. Julie Watson of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A federal labor authority ruled to strip the collective bargaining powers of a national union representing more than 450 U.S. immigration judges that has been a vocal critic of the Trump administration's policies. The Federal Labor Relations Authority sided with the U.S. Justice Department, you mean Bill Barr's Justice Department, in saying that immigration judges hold a position akin to management and therefore do not have a right to collective bargaining. The independent agency of the U.S. government governs labor relations between the federal government and its employees. Judge A. Ashley Tabador, president of the National Association of Immigration Judges, called the decision retaliation. The union has been a major force for more independence from the Justice Department, which oversees the immigration courts. While immigration judges wear black robes and preside over non-jury proceedings, they are considered federal attorneys with the Justice Department and can be removed from their positions by the U.S. Attorney General by the name of Bill Barr. In contrast, federal judges who oversee criminal and civil matters are more autonomous because they are appointed for life and work for the independent judicial system. So we'll just name the immigration judges attorneys, sort of like a team member. 
employee owned. The union's leaders have been outspoken critics of a broken immigration court system with a backlog that has ballooned to more than 1.2 million cases under this petty dictator by the name of Donald Trump. Of course, you know the embellishment on this narrative is mine and mine alone. It has also resisted a mandate from the administration requiring immigration judges to complete 700 cases annually to meet job performance standards. In other words, just sign the goddamn paper and deport them. You don't need to hear their case. How can you get 700 in a year if you're hearing what they have to say? Stop it. You are a team member, an employee owner. Four months ago, the union filed a lawsuit against the Justice Department over a new policy that prohibited them from speaking publicly about immigration law or even court policies. Judges who violate the policy can face reprimands or be suspended or removed because they're just team members, employee owners. The judges under previous administrations were allowed to speak in their personal capacities on issues relating to immigration if they made it clear they were not speaking on behalf of the Justice Department or the court system. The union vowed to fight the decision, which can be appealed to federal circuit courts. at the Associated Press bring us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Count all the votes, smothered Benedict Wednesdays. The head of the Kentucky State Police is stepping down days after a report surfaced about old training materials the agency used that encouraged cadets to be ruthless and quoted Adolf Hitler. Police Commissioner Rodney Brewer's resignation is effective today, Wednesday, and that was uh, in a statement by Kentucky Justice and Public Safety Cabinet Spokeswoman Morgan Hall. She did not address why Brewer is stepping down, but said Lieutenant Colonel Philip Burnett was selected to be acting commissioner. Brewer was appointed by Governor Andy Bashir. Now, of course, we know he is a Democrat in January after previously leading the agency from December of 20, 2007 to February of 2016. Bashir sidestepped questions yesterday, Tuesday, about whether he asked Brewer to resign. The Democratic governor thanked Brewer for his long public service career and said a broad search will be undertaken for a new commissioner. Well, that's rather nice, and I hope that they uh, do a little bit of vetting and make sure that they purge every neo-Nazi out of their police department. And how about this? Anybody who has neo-Nazi, proud boy, 3%er, oath keeper sentiments should not be a police officer, police captain, police commissioner, should not be in any capacity of law enforcement anywhere in the United States. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. (laughs) 
from a point at sea to the circles of your mind. A new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Take New Mover Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, both sides now. Aaron Sorkin's latest film, The Trial of the Chicago 7, takes us back to Chicago in 1968 and the politically motivated prosecution, or if you will, persecution, of seven members of a handful of different anti-Vietnam War movements and one Black Panther. Most of these defendants had come to peacefully protest during the Democratic National Convention, only to have Mayor Daley embroil them in an orgy of police violence. Now, Steven Spielberger's producer first pitched Sorkin way back in 2007, so that makes this film surprisingly timely. If you love Sorkin's TV work, you should know that this film feels very different. It's still set in a Sorkin world, where very intelligent people have a difficult job that reaches out to the public in some way, that both requires and values their expertise, but here Sorkin's dialogue is tighter and his pace snappier than you're used to. He even breaks up his signature walk and talk in the beginning by having each defendant cut into the previous one with an inappropriate continuation to what has just been said. The montage dramatizes our hero's eventual defense to their conspiracy charge that the only thing these people had in common was a cause, a time, a place and Richard Nixon's hatred. This division also speaks to Sorkin's larger point, and for this reading I take a cue from Jeet Heer's article on this film in The Nation. Effectively, Heer sees Sorkin greatly influenced by King. Yeah, not that King. Like many comfortable white moderates, Sorkin looks at protester versus repressor and bemoans the rift revealed when the ignored clash with the despotic. Can't we all just get along, he cries? We're all Americans, you know. And this movie does a fair job of making that point. Sadly, it would be more convincing if Sorkin hadn't had to fabricate one prosecutor's amenable personality, make up one sympathetic agent provocateur out of whole cloth, and bring us home with a moving and totally fictional ending. Still, the trial of the Chicago 7 is worth a watch. I mean, in a straight role, I can't believe Sasha Baron Cohen is so good. This has been Take the Mover Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at TakeTheMoverReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Jason Goldman. In the shadow of Wangshan Mountain in southeastern China lives a beige frog with black stripes. The concave-eared torrent frog, or Odorana tormoda, gets its name from its unusual hearing apparatus. It has kind of ear canal-like structure, like humans, and like most mammals. For most frog species, the eardrums are located on the body surface, on the lateral part of the body surface. But here, the eardrum is invisible because it is embedded deep inside the head, the skull. Biologist Albert Fang from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Back in 2006, Fang and his colleagues discovered that this unusual anatomy allows the frogs to hear ultrasound, which includes frequencies greater than 20 kilohertz. Biologists had always assumed that ability was restricted to some mammals, because it was only known in bats, whales, dolphins, and some rodents. We can't hear in that range. The streams that the frogs live in are quite noisy, but most of those sounds are low frequency. By restricting their vocalizations to the higher frequencies, including ultrasound, the frogs are better able to hear each other. The higher the frequency the less the signal is distorted, or at least masked by the ambient noise. In many animals, females prefer mating with larger males, usually because that's a sign of health and strength. And bigger males tend to produce lower frequency vocalizations. But with higher frequency calls being more effective in this habitat, Feng wondered if females might actually prefer smaller males. Over the course of several nights, the researchers captured 35 pairs of frogs engaged in what biologists call amplexus, which means while having sex. The biologists measured the length of each male, as well as the length of those males found nearby who were unlucky enough to be caught and also not having sex. Turns out, size really does matter. The females of this are very unusual in that they really prefer smaller males over larger males. Next, the researchers brought the frogs into the lab. Each female was placed alongside two males. Here, too, females opted to mate with smaller-bodied males, and an analysis of the mating calls showed that the smaller males did use higher-frequency sounds. The study was published in the Journal of Zoology. 
we're thinking by females preferentially choosing a small size males that actually we can see the trend over generations. You can see the gradual evolution changes in the trait over multiple generations that gradually develop this ultrasonic capabilities. What isn't clear yet is whether the females are visually assessing the males for their size or whether they just have an easier time hearing their higher frequency calls, making them more likely to mate with smaller males. That's exactly what Feng's team is testing now by broadcasting mating calls to the females in a laboratory with the lights out. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Jason Goldman. He seems sorry. We very clearly told him not to look up there. I'm honestly impressed that he was able to do it. Right? What did he balance on that big chair? Or... Yeah, I mean, I guess he'll just know what his gifts are this year. I really thought we had hidden them well. If they can find their presence, they can find a gun. 911, what is your emergency? Every day, eight kids and teens are unintentionally killed or injured by loaded and unlocked guns. Learn how to make your home safer at nfamilyfire.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and Family Fire. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. As fall turns to winter, the flu season will be upon us in force. The best way to avoid influenza is to get immunized. Everyone six months and older should be vaccinated. Those at increased risk for flu complications include children under the age of five and adults 65 and older, people with chronic health problems such as heart disease, asthma, and diabetes, and pregnant women. To get your annual flu vaccine, see your health care provider or go to a pharmacy, grocery store, or clinic in your area. If you get influenza, talk with your health care provider right away about antiviral medication. Thank you for joining us on A Minute of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetRootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping Progressive Radio at full power. At one of the demonstrations in Kenosha, Wisconsin, that erupted after black resident Jacob Blake was shot seven times in the back by a white police officer, Kyle Rittenhouse of Illinois apparently shot and killed two of the protesters and wounded a third. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. Rittenhouse is charged with what Wisconsin calls first-degree intentional homicide, what most jurisdictions call murder. Rittenhouse, who is 17, claims self-defense. After the shooting, he returned to his nearby home in Antioch, Illinois, 15 miles southwest of Kenosha, leading us to an issue that the Constitution specifically addresses, extradition. The Constitution says that a person charged with a crime in one state who is found in another shall be returned to the state where the crime occurred upon the demand of the governor. The Constitution did not say how this process was supposed to work, so Congress, early on in the country's history, passed the Extradition Act, which requires a judicial process. But the Supreme Court has made clear, as late as 1987, that an extradition proceeding is summary, and only two questions need be answered. Are the papers in order, and is the person in court the person that is sought? If so, as the Illinois judge at Rittenhouse's extradition hearing found, that person should be ordered returned to the state where the crime occurred. The founder of the Kenosha chapter of Black Lives Matter said that Rittenhouse, quote, needs to be taken to Wisconsin. The crime was there, which is legally right. Other provisions in the Constitution contain the guarantee of due process and a fair trial. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1879. That was the day that Will Rogers was born in Oolaga, Indian Territory, in what later became Oklahoma. Rogers grew up on a ranch and by 10th grade had dropped out of school to be a cowboy. Skilled with a lasso, he became a cowboy entertainer first in vaudeville, then in silent film. Rogers also had a syndicated column and a radio show where he became 
became a popular political commentator. With quick wit and humor, Rogers helped to shape public opinion. He brought humor to serious issues in a way later echoed by the likes of John Stewart and Stephen Colbert. Rogers often talked about the plight of the American worker. In 1931, he was asked to give a radio address for President Herbert Hoover's organization on unemployment. Rogers expressed the urgency of the unemployment that was sweeping the nation during the Great Depression. He said, quote, The only problem that confronts this country today is at least 7 million people are out of work. That's our only problem. There is no, there, there is no other one before at all. It's to see that every man that uh, wants to, able to work, is allowed to find a place to, to go to work, and also to arrange some way of getting a more equal distribution of the, of the wealth in country. Now, uh, the prohibition, we hear a lot about that. That, that, that's nothing to compare to your neighbor's children that, that are hungry. Here we are in a country with, with more wheat and more corn and more money in the bank and more cotton, more everything in the world. There's not a product that you can name that we haven't got more of it than any country ever had in, in the face of the earth. And yet we've got people starving. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. This is a Radio Labor report recorded on Wednesday, November 4th, 2020. I'm Mark Belanger. The only effective way out of the economic crisis caused by the pandemic is through social dialogue, according to a new report by the Global Deal Coalition. Social dialogue is the cooperation of governments, businesses, and labor unions. The coalition is a partnership of governments, businesses, and employer organizations, trade unions, civil society groups, and other organizations. Its newly released second report was the subject of a recent webinar. Guy Ryder, the Director General of the UN's International Labor Organization, was asked about the report. Mr. Ryder is the first unionist to head the organization in its 100-year history. What are the key messages? I think the, the key one in these extraordinarily difficult times, social dialogue simply has never been more important. Why? Because social dialogue helps us build resilience to absorb shocks of the type we're now experiencing. It helps us to find ways forward from crisis. And when there are tough decisions to be taken, it contributes greatly to finding fair, legitimate, and therefore accepted outcomes. And certainly the pandemic has caused enormous pain worldwide with, as we all know, more than a million people having already lost their lives, many millions more who have lost their livelihoods and their incomes, uh, and so many people now who fear that if they go to work, they run the risk of catching the virus. Let me just sort of focus in on one sector, which is very much on the minds of many uh, Global Deal participants, um, the garment industry. There, the lockdowns and other measures have resulted in a widespread uh, retail and factory closures, furloughs or, or layoffs, and these effects have rippled all along global value chains, with orders being cancelled and suppliers, brands and retailers often having been unable to pay workers or to keep them on, situations which just beg us to apply social dialogue. And other sectors, of course, have experienced similar or even worse. In the aggregate, we at the ILO estimate that in the second quarter of 2020, the equivalent of 495 million full-time job equivalents were lost around the world. And that figure is overwhelming. And I think that we have to accept that the aftermath and the effects on the labor market generated by this crisis are going to be with us for a considerable time. And what I think needs to be well understood and then acted upon is that the pain, the impact is falling disproportionately on those who are least able to cope with it, the most vulnerable in the world of work. So we think of women workers, young people, those with disabilities, indigenous communities. No country, no regions are immune. Latin America and the Caribbean have lost the equivalent of 80 million jobs, Africa 60, and Asia and Pacific 
no less than 265 million. And so I think we're all aware that we need to respond globally as well with multifaceted and comprehensive responses. And that means delivering, and it's not always easy, the right health, economic, employment and social policies in combination and at the right time. And that takes me back, of course, to social dialogue and to the global deal. Now, this second uh, flagship report focuses on the role of social dialogue in promoting lifelong learning and skills development in recovery uh, from the crisis. And it does so because one of the most important elements in building a better future of work is and will be investment in workers. And here is one of the dilemmas that we face immediately. We know that one of the impacts of the pandemic has been the massive disruption of education and training, be it schools, be it colleges and universities, be it workplace training. And that's it. International labor news you can use. You can find our features and daily newscasts on our website at radiolabor.net. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about global solidarity. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Smothered Benedict Wednesdays count all the votes. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 42 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of about 74 or so. Mainly sunny, winds will be light and variable, clear to partly cloudy tonight, lows in the mid-40s. And uh, winds will be light and variable, and the winds will be the same tomorrow, partly cloudy with highs in the low 70s. Confirmed coronavirus cases in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon have now spiked to 1,998 with seven confirmed deceased. Pollen is rated as none outside the window here at the mothership in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the region is good at 21 parts per million, and that daytime UV index is low at 2. Barometric pressure is rising at 30.18 inches. Visibility is at 9 miles, and relative humidity is down to 73%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. London is 53 and sunny. Rome is 68 degrees and mostly cloudy. I know I gave that out of order, but Paris is 53 and partly cloudy. Kiev is 48 and fair. Kabul is 60 and fair with wind. Hong Kong is 70 and clear. Tokyo is 54 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 67 with a rain shower. San Francisco, California is 55 degrees and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is 48 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is weather from around the world. Brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased and these people planted. These purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world.
anonymous worker bees at Reuters bring us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Chile's interior minister, Victor Perez, resigned amid a legislative move to oust him yesterday, Tuesday, in yet another blow for the administration of center-right president Sebastian Pinera. Panera's opposition in Congress had accused Perez, who was appointed in July, of mishandling violence in Chile's turbulent Acarunia region and failing to properly address alleged human rights violations during recent protests in Santiago. Perez resigned immediately following a lower chamber debate and vote yesterday, Tuesday, that approved pushing forward with his censure and impeachment. The former interior minister told reporters the vote was purely political and meant to weaken Panera's already ailing government. Well, yeah. In today's debate, it was impossible to convince absolutely anyone of anything, Perez said. Therefore, this is a political decision intended to cause damage to the government. Perez is the third minister to serve Panera in the, la- in the past year a tumultuous period in Chile, marked by mass protests over inequality and a raging coronavirus pandemic that have combined to hobble the South American nation's long, stable economy. Chile is the world's top copper producer. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Even more anonymous worker bees at Reuters bring us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Zimbabwean police are arrested for the second time, a journalist who has been critical of the government, as lawyers said, adding this time it was for contempt of court related to a post he made on Twitter. Hopwell Chinono was first arrested in July on charges of writing in support of anti-government protests. He was detained for more than a month at a maximum security prison until he was released on bail on the 2nd of September with one of the conditions that he stopped posting on his Twitter account until his case was finished. But Chinono opened a new Twitter account which he has been using to write about corruption and criticizing President Emerson Managorba's government. His comments have been unusually outspoken for a journalist in Zimbabwe, where critics are often dealt with harshly like death. He has been charged with contempt of court. He is alleged to have sent out a tweet, but at this moment the charges are not very clear, so we are weighing our options, his lawyer told Reuters by phone. Police spokesman declined to comment immediately. The arrest of Chonono and dozens of activists has led to accusations that the government is persecuting the opposition, a charge the authorities deny. Zimbabwe's worst economic crisis in more than a decade is fueling anger against the president who took over from the late Robert Mugabe after a coup two years ago, promising to revive the economy and greater freedoms for citizens. I guess that promise was not kept. Okay, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio will broadcast on, and we're going to meet up here tomorrow for Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Keep counting the damn votes. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon 
Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des théères Des photos de bord de mer D'un manche à d'un hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Quand mon nouvel Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère D'un manche à d'un hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 